I call this meeting of the Climate and Energy Committee to order, and um, we do have a quorum. So with that, um, Representative Kraft, uh, have you had a chance to look at the minutes? Thank you, Madam Chair. I have, and I would move their approval. Great. Um, any discussion or, excuse me, all those in, wait, discussion first. We'll discuss it. Anybody have any discussion on the minutes? Madam Chair. Representative Carroll. I think they're outstanding. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. I vote to approve. Okay, good. All those in favor? And if we were going to second, I'd second that. So. Wonderful. Okay, good. I, I think we see consensus coming. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Motion um, prevails and the minutes are adopted. We've got several bills today, so we're going to um, try to be efficient with our time. First up, um, one of our committee members. Uh, Representative Bierman is going to present House File 2014. <clears throat> Welcome to committee, Representative Bierman. Um, would you like to move your bill? Uh, yes, please, Madam Chair. I'd like to move the bill. And the, there was an, an amendment. Great, and the bill is going to be laid over for possible, co in, uh, excuse me, inclusion. And yes, there is an amendment, um, an A1. Yes, Madam Chair, the A1, I'd like to move the A1. It's just a uh, technical change uh, suggested uh, by Commerce. Great. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A1, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. <clears throat> Motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Um, why don't you go ahead and tell us about your bill, Representative Bierman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. Um, for those of you who have been on this committee previously, you've heard this bill before. So for you, this will be a refresher. For those of you who are new to the legislature, uh, we have uh, the Commerce Department here to present some background and we'll hear from a couple of testifiers. But, just to kick off, to state the situation and the problem, I will just note a few conditions. In all of your counties and mine, only about 12 to 18 percent of energy burdened constituents who qualify for weatherization services are able to access funding. Due to a lack of state investment, Minnesota ranks 16th of the 20 northern tier states receiving utilization, utilizing weatherization funding from the Department of Energy. Up to 40% in some places of applicants are denied services due to pre-weatherization requirements. And this bill came out of a bipartisan task force in 2020 on which I served that addressed these needs. Now with the passage of the 2021 bipartisan infrastructure law and a contribution of more state funding in this plan, in this bill, we are poised to make progress on the nearly 300 year backlog we face if we continued at the current rate of delivered assistance being provided. So this bill is about creating energy efficiency and conservation which saves money. This bill is about assisting the elderly and disabled in all of our communities. It's about safety and healthier homes for kids and families. And it's about creating sustainable jobs for years to come. So next, I would like to hear from the Commerce Department and then the testifiers if they are ready, Great. Madam Chair. I, yes, I think we have um, Michelle Grancy, Commissioner with the Department of Commerce. Welcome back to committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Acom. For the record, my name is Michelle Grancy. I serve as the Deputy Commissioner of Energy at the Minnesota Department of Commerce. I'm pleased to share testimony with you today regarding Representative Bierman's state supplementary weatherization grants bill. House file 2014 is similar to but not identical with the governor's 2023 budget bill in aiming to increase the number of income eligible households served in Minnesota by addressing significant deferrals, investing in homes to be safe and warm, and growing the clean energy workforce trained to make these important home improvements for Minnesotans who need it most. Homes with children, elderly or disabled occupants or those having a high energy burden or high energy use receive priority of service. 
The Walt's Flanagan Administration's Climate Action Framework has set a goal to weatherize a quarter of the homes in the state that have a household income of 50% of the state's median income or less by 2030. Simply put, without getting more homes into the weatherization queue, we won't meet that goal or even get close. Pre-weatherization funding prepares more homes and more workers to qualify for the federally funded weatherization assistance program. It addresses major limitations in the federal requirements for the weatherization assistance program by assisting local service providers to serve those that are hard to reach. Households that have structural building issues such as mold and moisture and by expanding services in areas that have traditionally been limited by federal requirements such as multifamily complexes. A 2022 case analysis by the University of Minnesota of six states with similar weatherization conditions, Washington, Vermont, Colorado, New York, Wisconsin, and Ohio, identified six key elements needed for expanding services. One, sustainably increase weatherization funding. Two, successfully navigate deferrals. Three, set long-term goals with long-term gains. Four, address barriers to multifamily weatherization. Five, address workforce challenges. And six, provide administrative relief in order to rapidly expand the program. As the work ramps up, so do the needs of having a specialized workforce statewide able to implement the USDOE or Department of Energy's standard work specifications as Building Performance Institute certified weatherization workers. Providing pre-weatherization training dollars to develop a pipeline of workers via nonprofits, labor organizations, job training centers, and educational institutions will further educate the current and future workforce on the specific requirements needed to complete these services. So Commerce um, contracts with 23 local service providers across Minnesota to deliver services statewide. These service providers are primarily community action partnership agencies with three tribal nations, one other nonprofit agency, and one county development agency also delivering services. In total, the network employs over 220 people and over 280 independent contractors to weatherize households of weatherization assistance program clients. The services are comprehensive, utilizing a whole house approach in order to achieve on average 20 to 30% in permanent energy reduction through implementation of efficiency measures. Two thirds of the funding is spent in greater Minnesota. According to a national evaluation of the program, households save on average $283 or more every year based on a one-time infusion of funds. The program has served over 60,000 households with weatherization services since 2005. We anticipate serving an additional 22,000 over the next five years. That ramp up in service is significant, but it is still less than 17% of the total eligible households. That's why pre-weatherization is so important. Pre-weatherizing a home has health and safety benefits to the residents in and of itself. But that work also makes the home eligible for weatherization, so there's an amplification effect that improves on the return of investment. A recent three-year assessment found that 25 to 40 percent of the households that receive a home assessment were denied services due to a multitude of reasons outside of the scope of the federally funded program, including health and safety issues caused by major roofing leaks, extreme moisture, water and mold issues, major plumbing or sewer issues, asbestos-laden vermiculite, and dangerous electrical wiring, all in homes in which people still live in when they're denied services. So while the ECO Act, the Healthy Air Program, and changes to the LIHEAP transfer are now addressing some of these areas, there are limits um, to each of the programs in its singular ability to address the issues to receiving services. Finally, due to federal program restrictions, the current program inequitably serves homeowners over renters. In fact, a five-year assessment found that only 13% of all households that were served were renters. In response to this, 
these realities. As Representative Bierman noted, an informal weatherization working group, including legislators, low-income advocates, utilities, service providers, and other partners were formed to assess barriers to service and establish recommendations for you all, Minnesota legislature and state WAP leaders. From that working group, multiple specific recommendations were provided, including four that I'll share. One, supplement the federally funded Weather Station Assistance Program with state resources annually for the next 10 years in order to ensure stable funding for a robust workforce to implement the measures equitably across the state. Two, allow for state funds to be utilized to address barriers to service, including but not limited to structural issues, workforce limitations, and outreach limitations. Three, provide legislative allowances for multifamily buildings to serve more renters. And four, engage stakeholders in the workforce development space to develop a coordinated statewide strategy that provides training across the state in areas of demonstrated need, factors equity into the effort, reduces competitiveness and increases synergy, and builds the needed workforce for the weatherization industry. With that, I thank you, Chair Acom, for the opportunity to testify. We look forward to continuing to work with Representative Bierman and you all as this bill and the governor's budget moves forward. And Representative Susinski, did you have a question for the commissioner? Or yeah, it can wait till towards the, if you want to have the other sure. plan people, Perfect. Okay. Okay. whatever, yeah. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. I mean, I probably will have one for her. But, okay. Yeah. Um, Next on the testifying list, we have Bill Grant from the Minnesota Community Action Partnership. <clears throat> Welcome to committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Acom and members. My name is Bill Grant. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Community Action Partnership. The partnership represents the 24 community action agencies that serve all 87 counties in Minnesota. 19 of whom deliver weatherization assistance to eligible households throughout much of the state. Through the federal weatherization program, we have been weatherizing single family homes and multifamily rental buildings since the late 1970s. Weatherized homes see a nearly $300 average annual savings on their home heating bills. However, <clears throat> as uh, Commissioner Grancy mentioned, at the current rate of homes completed, it'll take many decades to weatherize all of the income eligible homes in the state. The bill in front of you today will, would allow us to accelerate that pace significantly by addressing a major barrier to program achievement, namely restrictive federal program rules. House file 2014 authorize, authorizes supplementary state grants for the purposes outlined in Minnesota state weatherization plan. A top priority for such funds as identified by the Commerce Department's uh, weatherization work group from last year that Representative Bierman mentioned, is the installation of pre-weatherization measures to address building defici deficiencies that otherwise prevent energy savings measures from being installed in eligible homes. Federal program rules prevent expenditures on home repairs that must be completed before many homes can be weatherized. Currently up to half the homes uh, otherwise eligible for services must be deferred due to problems ranging from asbestos-laden insulation, outdated wiring, failing roofs, and inaccessible crawl spaces, problems common in many older homes. Supplemental and more flexible state funding would be a bridge to the federal program by allowing necessary repairs to take place prior to implementing traditional weatherization services. House file 2014 also begins to address the serious workforce shortages affecting the program, particularly in greater Minnesota, by appropriating funds to recruit and train weatherization workers and provide financial incentives to independent contractors to perform weatherization services. Weatherization saves consumers money on energy costs, reduces climate warming emissions, otherwise released to heat homes, restores and increases the value of aging housing stock, and preserves affordable housing that is now in critically short supply. The weatherization investments outlined in Representative Bierman's bill will deliver great value to Minnesota taxpayers, communities, and those who struggle every day to make ends meet. Thanks, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank members you, Mr. Might have. Grant. Maybe we'll hold off and finish the testimony before we um, go to questions. Next, um, we have Jason Foy 
um, with Tri-County Community Action. Welcome to committee. Mr. Foy, please state your name for the record and proceed. I'm Jason Foy. I'm the um, Weatherization Housing Director at Tri-County Community Action Partnership, which services Todd Crowing and Morrison counties in Minnesota. Pre-weatherization is important for all residents. We service with federal weatherization grants. Managing a weatherization program, we run into deferrals weekly. Deferrals and weatherizations happen because homes do not qualify under current program guidelines. When we run into homes which cannot be addressed under current federal grants, we end up deferring the home until the problem can be resolved. On average, one out of every five homes we visit will end up being a deferral. One issue that's always broke my heart was clutter. Clutter may be easy to overcome, but not for everyone. Imagine you're walking into a client's home and that client is elderly and disabled, 70 years old and sitting in a wheelchair. During the audit, you walk around the home and you can sense the life that's been lived and you can see a struggle. No one has been around for years and upstairs there are boxes of personal belongings covered in dust. Unfortunately, boxes are stored around areas contractors need to work and funding limitations could prevent this home from being serviced by weatherization. With the appropriation of these funds, we would be able to address this and more common issues like mold or minor structural damage. With weatherization, everything can be calculated and verified. Energy modeling can verify the house is expected to save 10 to 30% energy or more in homes. Simple reasons for deferral, which on average may cost $500 to $1,000 to remediate, are preventing Minnesota residents from receiving federal weatherization grants. Homes which sometimes are spending two to $3,000 a year paying for energy bills, that burden is then put on energy assistance, our power companies, the entire gas and electrical grids. The burden is not just on one home, the burden affects all of us and the reliability of providing safe, attainable energy. The other important part of this funding bill is the recruitment and training of staff and contractors. Acquiring, training, and maintaining contractors and staff is a huge challenge for our network. We have other agencies who depend on local contractors to do the work and in-house staff. These contractors are small local businesses in all corners of the state. The contractors and staff are Minnesota residents who live and work directly in their communities. Having a diverse, robust contractor base and field staff working at agencies is important to ensure the housing stock of Minnesota is being improved not only today for the people who live in them and can take an immediate benefit, but for the people who will own those homes 20 to 40 years from today. We owe it to Minnesota residents to ensure they can access federal grants. Thank you, Mr. Foy. And I think we have um, uh, also one public, so one person signed up for public testimony, Aurora Autron with 100% Campaign. Welcome to committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Uh, my name is Aurora Vautrin, and I'm the Legislative and Political Director for the Minnesota 100% Campaign. Um, thank you, Chair Acom and members of the committee for your time today. Um, and I am here to testify in support of House File 2014, Representative Bierman's bill to support pre weatherization home repairs and our home repair workforce. Um, this bill closes important gaps in our existing state weatherization program, ensuring more Minnesotans in their homes have access to its benefits. Due to eligibility requirements in federal law, some Minnesotans are denied weatherization services until their homes receive underlying repairs, a barrier that excludes those who don't have the funds to cover these upfront costs. Uh, we are glad to see Representative Bierman's proposal to expand access to weatherization by improving outreach to homeowners, investing in pre-weatherization improvements, and supporting the recruitment and training of auditors, installers, and contractors who make these improvements. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else who wanted to speak on this bill? Seeing none, we will turn to member questions. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, so you know, part of the some of these programs with the weatherization, you know, is there a clawbacks as far as when you sell a property? Um, as far you know, I know in some of these federal programs and. and uh, as far as they're concerned, that you know, you have to hold on to the home for at least 10 years. Otherwise, you have to pay uh, the part of the process, the the project cost back. Uh, is that at all included into this uh, portion of, of of money? Representative Bierman. Madam Chair, Representative Sudzinski, there are no clawbacks in the bill. Uh, if you want a further explanation, I can bring somebody back about that. But sure. they're not. Uh, maybe um, Mr. Grant perhaps could comment on that. But I know that um, the work being done, um, it would be a problematic type of operation to figure out clawbacks or put that into the legislation, I believe. But Mr. Grant. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Representative 
Uh, no, I mean, this is a program that's been in operation for 50 years, and we've been weatherizing homes uh, over that period of time. The program at the federal level has never required clawbacks of funding if, if a, an applicant should move or, or become deceased. Representative Susinski. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, my, my feeling on this, you know, foundationally is that if you're pouring money now, not in just to weatherization, but actually improvements, so you're replacing uh, roofs, you're replacing whatever uh, siding on the outside of someone's home, you know, you're actually foundationally changing the value of the home as well. And so you're adding assets. So you're taking your asset that could be worth X amount of dollars, using state grant money, putting it into this project for a, pro for a home that doesn't currently qualify into a program that already has shortages of funds because there's over applicants. So you're adding more people to the pool, um, but you're, yet you're not asking anything back from that property or a state uh, a, a, at a time of sale, uh, which they would wholly benefit, whether it's a renter, you know, so if you're a, a, a rich uh, investment owner that maybe owns an apartment complex because of the uh, additions of this bill, if they were to sell this with new shingles on the roof or whatever that might be, you're adding real value. And I don't understand, you know, when you're when you know the tax dollars are so precious, why you wouldn't do that. Representative Beerman or Mr. Grant, Mr. Grant. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and Representative. Uh, well, again, uh, we're following the federal program rules here. Uh, these aren't the state's rules. Secondly, I would say that for many of the communities that we're weatherizing homes in. The value to the community of improving the housing stock certainly outweighs any individual benefit that might be accruing to a homeowner. Representative Susinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just, you know, what would you say, so let's say we don't put money into uh, the pre weatherization which would be shingles or whatever that might be. How much of a shortage is there for houses that currently qualify the program, which are un insufficient funds to, to do the current projects? Mr. Grant. Or Mr. Representative I, I just wanted to clarify the question on you're, you're saying if we didn't do any pre weatherization how much shortfall would there be in the vast number of homes that are out there in your district and mine uh, I think I have seen up to 40 percent of homes so we're talking about hundreds and thousands of homes in a county like mine thank, thank you madam chair just you know the reason I'm asking that is is we're already seeing a shortage in the homes that we're able to service under the current program, under the current guidelines, without putting money into, you know, the exterior or the pre-qualification rules. And now you're going to add not only high cost changes, so the exterior portions that really, quite frankly, don't, didn't qualify that home for a potential to uh, be qualified for these grants. We're already not fulfilling that need. Now you're going to add piles and piles of more homes on top of that pile of, of things that we can't uh, keep up with. Does that jive with what I'm seeing as far as this bill and what it will do? And maybe I just want to um, ask for a little clarification about what qualifies as um, pre-weatherization projects. Is that roofing? Is that siding? Um, maybe a little um, clarification about what is included in those categories might be helpful. Mr. Grant. Madam Chair, uh, it's really unique to the individual situation. Uh, we, f we find homes, uh, for example, that were weatherized uh, or originally constructed in the 1940s and 50s that at the time the state of the art was uh, vermiculite for insulation. And we've since found, of course, that that vermiculite contains asbestos and would need to be removed, but also represents a health hazard in its current condition. So in, in that case, uh, Removing that not only improves the, the health of the occupants, but uh, allows the weatherization work to proceed. So it really is unique to the, to the home. And uh, there are going to be cases where the repairs that would be needed would exceed uh, the program's ability, even with the pre-weatherization funds, uh, to uh, conduct the work. And then just to clarify, is um, repair or replacing a roof part of we, a, a qualified project for pre-weatherization or repairing or replacing siding? Madam Chair, potentially okay. uh, in cases where attic insulation is, is the needed um, uh, efficiency measure, 
uh, you wouldn't put new attic insulation into a home that had a leaking roof. So uh, that, that yes, that would be addressed first. Thank you. That's helpful. And um, back to Representative Suzinski's question. I think, Rep Representative Bierman, you were going to respond. Yeah, I was just going to say that, it, like uh, Mr. Grant did, that it, it does depend on the structure, and there are certain limits to whether they're going to provide that work on any given home. But I think, you know, to put it in perspective, most of these members in a community, I mean, I don't think we really have to uh, think that people are in this predicament who are low income are thinking about house flipping or getting these benefits and selling the house quick and moving out. I mean, I think that if that was something that was happening, that was something to be aware of or is a focus of, um, you know, the, the, the it's just it's just not happening is what I understand. One final question, Representative Swazinski. Can it be a really long one then? <laughs> <laughs> um, and just to, just to kind of wrap it up, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Bierman, you know, looking at um, kind of the way this is structured, um, you've got, you know, 2.6 million, 21 million in 2025, and then 690,000 uh, going off into the sunset. Um, you know, what, what is the estimate on, uh, on like, what could the, the agency potentially get by? And then from an educational standpoint, you know, uh, one of the issues that we have across the state uh, is uh, competition within higher education and educational units. So one of the fears I have when you have, you know, a training program that might came up to this and, you know, let's say you're a small town uh, college or something like that that may or may not have a carpentry program, you know, are you going to compete with that program and steal potential candidates uh, away from that? Um, or are you going to, or high schools, will you work with high schools as far as the education? Will they be allowed to, to uh, apply for these grants to develop their, their carpentry programs within the schools? Um, how will that work? Madam Chair, I think I will let Mr. Grant handle that as well since this is what he does. Mr. Grant. Madam Chair and, and Representative, uh, the training grant program is really designed to uh, provide training support for this very specific certification that's required to be a weatherization worker, either an auditor at the front end when the homes are evaluated or a quality control inspector at the back end to make sure that the work was performed properly. Uh, so this, the, the training grant money is really tied very specifically to the needs of this program. Rep well, who would qualify for that? Like, would a college, Madam Chair, would a college, current colleges be able to get that money or will they just have to come to you and ask for it? Mr. Grant. Madam Chair and, and uh, Representative, I, I think that's probably a question for the department, but uh, my understanding is that we would be working with a wide range of potential uh, training avenues, uh, be they vo uh, vocational technical schools, high schools, and what have you. Yes. And um, Mr. Eloff, I think, has something to add to that as well, please. Madam Chair, in response to Representative Swinzitsky's question, I just note that the bill uh, on uh, lines uh, 323 and 324, um, in terms of who can get awarded training grants, a job training center or educational institution that the Commissioner of Commerce determines has the ability to train workers for weatherization careers. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Eloff. Um, next on the list, we have um, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know we don't, we have a, a blank appropriation in the bill. I see that we've got governor's recommendations, but we still get to decide what that is. So I was trying to go between the two to figure some things out. And in the bill, you have up to 10% training for training, up to 10% for pre brotherization I didn't see anything in the bill, and maybe I missed it, for um, administrative costs. I see the governor has FTEs of, starting in 2025, of six FTEs if you go to that level. But do you, you have a thought as to how much it would take administratively? We don't have a fiscal note. We just have the governor's recs. So, and you don't have, it's a blank appropriation. So I'm just trying to wrap my mind around the money part of it. Representative Bierman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, as far as any FTEs that commerce would have need, I would have to defer to them. But um, I don't have a number because 
as you said, we we don't have an appropriation there. We're waiting on targets, so that might be a bridge we cross closer to the end. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, that yeah, that makes sense. I I just thought maybe you'd have a set. Sometimes people put things in bills and say you know two to five percent for administration, and I just didn't see that language. If you had it in there, I may have missed it. But mm -hmm. I just that was really the question. I, I understand there's a lot of unknowns, and I'm just trying to put a little um, substance to what we don't know. Um, but one thing did kind of, as you had a testifier, Mr. Foy, talk, and it didn't occur to me that someone's clutter in the house might be considered pre-weatherization. -weather, pre and I realize that you've got several sections of existing statute on lines 4.14 that are um, listed out, and I didn't take the time to right here to look up all of those three statutory references. But I'm wondering if you happen to know what does qualify for pre-weatherization and would decluttering someone's home qualify? Because he was saying one out of five homes that he encounters have some sort of issue, but decluttering a home is a very expensive, extensive process. Um, I'm just curious, what would what, say uh, you about that? Madam Chair, Chairman. Uh, Representative O'Neill, I would logically think decluttering is not part of the service that they would provide necessarily, but um, I'll defer to Mr. Grant on that one. Mr. Grant. And <clears throat> Madam Chair and Representative O'Neill, um, the pre-weatherization, as you, as you point out, is defined already in statute. I don't have the statute in front of me, um, but it, it is rather specific with, with respect to which kinds of activities. I honestly don't remember um, whether or not uh, uh, decluttering is, is a, an allowable activity or not. I'd have to consult the statute. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I, I see our wonderful nonpartisan researcher is looking that up. It just caught my ear, Madam Chair, because it's like, wow, that's a direction I didn't expect this bill to go. <laughs> so um, it just caught my ear. Um, while our wonderful staff is looking that up, I do have something that maybe you could put a little meat on for me because it's just hard when we have um, not we don't have fiscal note and I understand why and we don't have numbers and I get it because we don't have targets. But you had mentioned in the testimony that we have 280 existing contractors and this bill is up to 10% of the appropriation to do more training. Um, and I believe Mr. Grant had mentioned the fact that, you know, we're woefully behind and in, in, in Representative Bierman, you would even said it would take 300 years to really accomplish all the need. So I'm just wondering kind of where is the tipping point where we actually we begin to see some progress and some change. Um, if we already have 280 contractors and as you said, 22,000 more homes in the next five years can be um, weatherized at the current pace. But like where, like how much is it gonna to take to actually make an impact? Representative Bierman. Madam Chair, Representative O'Neill, um, I think the uh, first point of tipping is getting some funding into this bill and beginning this process and building the workforce. So until we do that, you know, we're, we're, we're down. I think I mentioned in my comments, we're 16th of the 20 northern tier states as far as number of homes that we are doing. Wisconsin next door puts $60 million of state money into this program every each and every year. And it takes some time to train, do the training for people through the institute or wherever they may come from. And uh, then I, you know, I also think that we need to engage uh, the labor resources that are out there. And in our previous uh, committee hearing, Representative Swazinski talked about, you know, the labor shortage. We also have a labor shortage. So it's not really possible to say that if we, you know, are going to be at a certain point in any given year, really. But we won't be anywhere close if we don't get the funding in line first and then begin to train workers through the Building Performance Institute and recruiting people through the CAP agencies who know that if they do the training, they will have a job going on into the future where they can do this as a living and make a career of it. So I'm not sure what that looks like, but I think we're in the dark about a lot of things with the economy right now, and this is another one. But the important thing is we start, we get the funding in place, and then we work on building out the workforce, and as we pick up speed, we'll do more and more. 
And I think Mr. Elaf has a question, some clarification about your earlier comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, actually, the statutory definition of pre-weatherization measure is quite general. It says it means an improvement that is necessary to allow energy conservation improvements to be installed in a home. And I, I assume that word necessary is referring back to the federal regulations. But in the bill at line 220 and 221, it says that these, uh, the grants can be allocated to install pre-weatherization measures established by the commissioner under a certain section of law in the ECO Act, which says that the commissioner was to establish a list of pre-weatherization measures by uh, March 15th of 2022. So it may be the, maybe the Department of Commerce knows more about what's in that list. I see Deputy Commissioner Grancy coming up, so maybe she can come and offer a little clarification. Thank you. Madam Chair, Representatives, um, I do not have the list in front of me right now, but I can speak to the fact that that list was developed by March 15th, as was designated. It was done in conjunction with a number of stakeholders and includes um, things similar to what we were talking about by way of mold and moisture remediation. So, you know, we have seen and, and Jason, Mr. Foy would be um, best to be able to speak to some of the conditions of the households that he has been in or other service providers, um, but walking into a house that has black mold all around the bedroom of a child, right? Getting in there and being able to, to clean that out in such a way that it's a healthy um, environment again. We don't wanna tighten up a home that doesn't have uh, strong ventilation, uh, clarity, um, you know, you think about, was it 2019, the winter of 2019 in February when we got 11 inches of rain and the ground was still frozen? Mm -hmm. And if you drove through any neighborhood in South Minneapolis, you would see carpet across, strewn across everybody's yard, right? We are working with the elderly. We're working with people that are disabled. We're working with folks that do not have the economic means to be able to go and pull out that carpet, go and uh, regrade or ensure that there's, um, that water infiltration doesn't continue. So pre-weatherization measures can look like things like um, installing a sump pump in a 1950s home that now has water infiltration, right? As we put money into homes, we wanna ensure that, that that money is well spent and that the weatherization measures continue um, in the long term. So it's any number of things, asbestos remediation, but it's those things that are necessary in order to preserve the health and safety of the home and in order for the weatherization to take place. We can certainly provide the list um, for the committee. Thank you, appreciate that. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. That list would be very helpful. Again, this sort of took a conversation path I didn't expect at all. I know Representative Bierman and I had had a conversation offline before the committee and had a pretty in-depth conversation about this, but I didn't expect it to go there. So I, I appreciate that. We, I think before, I'm sure this is gonna be a conversation possibly for the omnibus bill, so we can look at it prior to that. But yes. um, it, it's just, it's a little bit hard for me to wrap my head around because as you say those things, I'm literally, the dollar signs are flying in my head. Um, I have a 1904 two-story home that had vermiculite and it had to be remediated before um, the previous owners could sell it. And so that was something that they found that was an impediment in the market. So they remediated it and put new in insulation in my very, very, very old attic. Um, I still have different issues in that 1904 home. I, I understand that. I also understand how incredibly expensive it is to remediate those sort of things. And, you know, if you talk about roofs and siding, I mean, that's my small little two-story in-town home would be fourteen or 15000 to do the siding. And I don't even know what a roof is today, but these are... So what I'm trying to say is I, I can see this money for pre-weatherization getting gobbled up really, really quickly because those things are incredibly expensive. Weatherization is expensive, but the things that you're kind of alluding to are, are rather expensive. So these are all conversations I think we need to have because it... You know, even if we put the governor's recommendation was $21 million in, 2015, or in 2025, that could not go very far, <laughs> you know, depending on what is the allowable. I, the last question I'm going to ask is just, is there any kind of cap 
in the bill or would you consider some sort of a cap on expenditures as I just said I mean if we're going to do a roof and siding and you know pull out every uh, so a, if a room is full of mold there's a reason as you know you've got some sort of water infiltration so you've got to pull off all of that sheetrock and you've got to find the leak and then you've got to probably pull out all the flooring and maybe it's just that room or maybe it's the adjourning or adjacent room or the three you know I mean this just it could be a sixty thousand dollar remediation it's you know I used to work in construction and I know we've got oh he's not here so representative Meckland I would normally point to but he's not here right now but he could tell you how expensive these sort of things are so one is there a cap of expenditures for pre weatherization and two if there's not is that something that you would maybe consider representative Beerman thank you madam chair um, and I'm thinking back to previous years when we had this conversation and I seem to remember that there was a dollar amount affiliated with that but I may need to ask mr. Grant if that's the case or Ms. Cramsey uh, Representative, I don't recall a cap on that, um, and I completely understand the concern. Uh, the challenge being that because all of the other um, spaces that we've utilized have caps, we keep walking away from the toughest projects. And so I, I think it's a worthwhile discussion um, for, for sure and a difficult one because every time we walk away, there's still a family living there. And these are families that, you know, a family of four maybe is less than 60,000. The average family that we're serving is making 18, 19, 20,000 a year. So you're absolutely right. They cannot afford to do any of these upgrades themselves. Representative Swazinski, final question. Thank you. And just, just to clarify, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You mentioned uh, like carpet removal. Would this bill allow you to replace carpeting as well so like representative Bierman uh, madam chair representative Swazinski I have not heard carpet installation mentioned at all which you know being a um, carpet retailer um, that's getting the wheels turning on that but um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry uh, no I have not heard carpeting or flooring this is a structural issues relating to s tightening homes and uh, making sure that that their energy burden is very focused on energy burden and that's what the bill is about and I will just say oh. that um, we saw Mr. Grant shaking his head no that that is not okay. thank so, you so, thank you that so madam chair so the the bill would fund the removal of a carpet but not the reinstallation of it representative Beerman and I'm just going off what the, yep. the, the, the commissioner said. So I'm just ask, literally asking, trying to discuss this bill. Commissioner Grancy, did you have an answer for that? We're going to bring Mr. Grant down. I think he has an answer for that. Very well. Thanks, Madam Mr. Chair Grant. and Representative. Again, and I think Representative Beerman just said this, uh, these are improvements needed to complete weatherization work taking out a carpet putting in new carpeting <clears throat> not connected with weatherizing homes one final question representative Swazinski. but madam madam chair uh, you mentioned if there's black mold in the home that that would have to get removed as part of the remediation pre weatherization so if there's black mold in the carpet black mold in the flooring black mold you'd have to pull that out am I correct I mean so am I understanding this correctly because I, I think we're on yeah yes, have it. mr. Grant madam chair and, and representative you know I think the suggestion that we consult the list of allowable activities that has already been developed and guides this program uh, would would be the best use of, of the committee's time um, seeing no further questions um, closing comments um, representative Beerman thank you madam chair very good conversation a number of points that were brought up and that's why we do committee hearings on bills this bill is in its fifth year up here and it's getting better all the time and you've drawn out some more questions and we will get some answers Great. thank you and with that the bill is laid over um, next on the agenda we have representative Hollins and house file 849 
And as she's making her way to the table, um, Representative Hollins moves eight, House File 849 be laid over for possible inclusion. And I see there is a DE1 to get the bill in the shape that you'd like. Any, can you tell us a little bit about the DE1? Uh, thank you, Chair Acom, and thank you, committee members. The DE1 is an update to last year's previous bill, so we've got some updated numbers and updated provisions, and so it would get the bill into the shape I would like it to be in. Any discussion to the DE1? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. So with that, um, Representative Hollins, please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members. Um, so this is a bill that I brought last year to upgrade um, electrical panels in houses, or I should say homes, not just houses. Um, as I tell my constituents, this is maybe not the sexiest of topics involving uh, climate and energy, but it is one that is particularly important in my district, where we have a number of 100-year-old houses that are at their absolute maximum capacity for um, electrical use. Um, and so, you know, sometimes folks talk about uh, getting an electric car and there's absolutely no way on the panels that most of our houses have they would be able to do that. Um, let alone getting something like an electric stove to replace their gas stove. Um, so what this would really do is make sure that we are um, it creates a grant program to make sure that folks who are low income or moderate income would be able to upgrade their electrical panels. Um, I think that it's, it's an investment in equity um, and access so that nobody's left out of this energy transition that we are doing currently. Um, it provides grants to get residential electric panels up to date. Um, and I will say the cap is at 150 percent of the area median income, which is not a lot. You think in, in St. Paul, I did the math and it's about $89,000, a little over $89,000 a year for a family of four. So we're not talking about high income individuals. I would consider myself moderate income and I do not qualify. So um, it will, it makes the upgrades make sure that we're preserving the existing housing stock. It creates safer homes by replacing out of date fuse boxes with modern circuit breakers. Um, it's, it'll support good jobs in the electrical field. And it also expands consumer choice by making homes more ready for the innovative electric technologies that are currently being marketed to individuals. So I would, I have several testifiers here to speak on behalf of the bill, and um, I would like to invite them here. Great. We'll turn to the testifiers. First, we have Eric Fowler from Fresh Energy. Welcome to committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you to the chair uh, and members of the committee. My name is Eric Fowler. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm a senior policy associate on Fresh Energy's buildings team. Uh, Fresh Energy is a nonpartisan Minnesota-based clean energy policy nonprofit dedicated to advancing the clean energy economy. And uh, I am grateful to testify in favor of HS 849, which will provide grants to upgrade residential electric panels in low and middle income homes, both single and multifamily. Uh, adequate electrical capacity is a major barrier to residential electrification um, and electric vehicle expansion, and it's often hidden. Right, uh, residents may not realize they need a panel upgrade until they're also getting bids on a heat pump or an EV charger. Whether residents pursue electrification for home comfort reasons, indoor air quality, uh, climate pollution reduction, or energy independence, we know that our homes are continuing to electrify. This program helps to level the playing field with panel upgrade grants for low and moderate income Minnesotans so that that next generation of electric appliances and vehicles are available for all, uh, not just for the wealthy few. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I will also be available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. Next, we have Andy Snope with IBEW um, Local 292. 
<clears throat> Welcome back to committee, Mr. Snow. State your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Andy Snope. I'm with uh, IBEW Local 292. Um, we represent about 5,000 electrical workers who work throughout the state of Minnesota. Our members and the contractors that our members work for perform this work. And uh, despite what Representative Holland said, we do think it's kind of sexy. So that's <laughs> <laughs> what we do. <laughs> Our members and contractors uh, perform this work. Much of that work uh, of electrical panel upgrades for residential dwellings are performed by small electrical contractors, uh, one or two person shops. While we move towards more renewable energy production and towards electrification, this bill is a piece of that puzzle to provide homes with the needed added electrical capacity to become electrification ready. In conjunction with electrical infrastructure upgrades to the distribution system, Electrical panel upgrades will help to provide the homeowner with increased capacity and circuit expansion space to add solar production and energy storage, electrical vehicle charging, air source uh, HVAC and air source water heating systems, and added electrical appliances within the home. This bill addresses the greatest need first, typically in areas of underserved communities, in my years in the industry as an electrician, I saw the greatest need for this work in the areas of the metro and rural uh, parts of the state where the largest economic disparities exist. Most typically in single and multifamily rental units where most likely landlords are not going to make this investment or homeowners uh, don't have the economic means to make these investments in home energy and efficiency needs. This bill, this bill helps to overcome those economic barriers. The IBEW has been working with stakeholders on this proposal for quite some time. Uh, not only does this bill provide the incentive for homeowners to upgrade electrical panels, but it also helps to provide an economic stimulus to jobs uh, and also a jobs component by providing these grants to electrical contractors and electricians who perform this work. Again, mostly small businesses. The language within this bill reiterates that the state requirement that this work is performed by a licensed electrical electrical contractor and electricians. <clears throat> uh, language when, within this bill also requires that workers employed by these electrical contractors are paid area standard wages and benefits. These requirements help to assure the homeowner and property owners that they will be receiving the highest quality installation using the highest quality, best trained individuals to perform this work. Thank you Representative Hollins for all your work with stakeholders to author and bring forward this bill. Committee members, please vote yes on 849. Uh, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Chair. Acom. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Next, Thank we you. have um, Mike Robertson with Habitat for Humanity. Welcome to committee, Mr. Robertson. State your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Acom. My name is Mike Robertson. I am the Brush with Kindness Manager at Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity. The mission of Twin Cities, as many of you probably know, is to bring people together to create, preserve, and promote affordable home ownership and to advance racial equity in housing. Our home repair program, called A Brush With Kindness, helps low-income homeowners maintain safe and stable homes. The vast majority of our clients make 30% of the area median income or less in the metro. And in every case, the home that they are living in is not only their largest asset, but it's also their most affordable housing option. As our work uh, at Twin Cities and other, uh, and other developers evolves to include electrification and decarbonization, the bill under consideration is the right kind of resource at the right time to help us and other housing organizations leverage the value of solid existing housing stock and to pave the way for an electrical improvement that not only benefits the environment, but also addresses a major health and safety issue for the homeowners. Just a quick story, Patricia, one of my clients, is an African-American homeowner who's lived in North Minneapolis for over 30 years. Her home is immaculate inside and out, but she contacted us because as an older adult, she had some accessibility modifications that she needed help with, and she was also having some electrical issues and kept, quote, blowing fuses. When I assessed her property, the electrical panel was in fact a fuse box with four fuses for the entire house. Considering that current electrical code requires at least that many circuits in just the kitchen, it was clear that the circuits were simply overloaded and unsafe. So a typical panel upgrade pre-pandemic, 
uh, to a 200 amp service would have cost us between two and three thousand um, dollars. But in this case, because it was a fuse box, we were upgrading. We had to do the electrical meter and the mast and the overhead wiring, which pushes the the cost at that time over five thousand dollars. And I would say post pandemic, a project like that would be almost double that. We were able to do that uh, using program resources um, and made Pat's home much safer, uh, but by removing the, and also by removing that, that barrier of pre-electrification, uh, as others have stated, she now can more easily take advantage of clean, highly efficient green technologies, such as rooftop solar, air source heat pumps for heating, cooling, and water heating. These improvements will be good for Pat's monthly expenses, the indoor air quality of her home, and of course, good for the environment. Grants like the one proposed in the, in the bill uh, supplement available Inflation Reduction Act funding that we know is coming. They support the move towards a decarbonized economy, which we know is coming. They support affordable neighborhood housing stock. They support local trade contractors and housing organizations. And most importantly, they support the health, safety, and stability of homeowners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robertson. And our final um, testifier, Mike Bull with Minnesota Power. <clears throat> Welcome to committee, Mr. Bull. State your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Mike Bull here on behalf of Elite Minnesota Power and we appreciate the opportunity to testify in favor of Holland's, Representative Holland's House File 849 and thank Representative Holland's for reintroducing this bill this year. We like this one. <laughs> yeah. uh, for our customers that wish to increase their efficient use of electricity, the home's electric panel, as you've heard from other testifiers, can be a surprising roadblock to doing so. As a general rule, the focus of these customers is on the excitement related to the electric appliance they wish to purchase, an air source heat pump, an electric induction stove, heat pump water heater, or on the vehicle, uh, an electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid. Uh, but these customers can run into difficulty when they realize their home doesn't have enough electrical capacity to support these electric appliances and charging equipment. And as others have shared, upgrading the electric panel can cost thousands of dollars. This is the barrier that Representative Hollins is working to reduce through this panel upgrade, upgrade program. We support a reliable, affordable, and equitable clean energy transition, and this bill targets support to removing barriers for whom uh, this additional cost would be difficult to bear. Uh, we urge your support for the bill and thank you for the opportunity to comment. Representative Garofalo, my colleague, Zach Martin is here to answer any difficult <laughs> questions. <laughs> <that> you... <laughs> to that point, Representative uh, No, I just, I, I just wanna ask a question of my, uh, not a, the testifier, but also a constituent, a constituent who now is, has the misfortune of having me <laughs> represent him at the Capitol. Uh, a serious question. Um, if someone doesn't have the money to upgrade the electric panel in their house, how in Lord's name do they approve, how can they afford an electric car, a heat source pump, or rooftop solar? Sure. Those are large capital expenditures. And I'm aware of our co-ops providing incentives right now to get people to off-peak metering, but it seems like we are hearing another bill here to literally subsidize the entire chain of electrification. Can you just tell me, and Mike, I don't mean to be that accusatory in my question, but I mean, how in God's green earth does this work that if someone can't afford that aspect of the purchase and the upgrade, how can they afford those items? Yeah. And what I'll just say before turning it over to the testifier, <laughs> there are as a whole range of possible um, improvements a person can make to their home, whether it's just a, an electric um, cooktop to an induction cooktop to rooftop solar. So there's a whole range of possible things, but I can certainly turn it over to um, Representative Hollins or Mr. They're yeah, both. The question was the pointed question was at my constituent. <laughs> okay, Mr. Mr. Bull. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair, Representative <clears throat> Garofalo. I think that's the answer: is that there are, there is a, a suite of, uh, of uh, programs that will be helpful to folks uh, to enable their uh, clean energy transition if that's an area that they would like to uh, go into. So your your uh, Co-op Dakota Electric provides significant opportunities in this regard. I think there are other other programs around the state that will help with EVs, air source heat pumps, and and now this panel upgrade uh, program. Thank you, Mr. Bolt. Representative Collins. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Representative Collins, would you like to respond? I just wanted to give a real-world example response. If he's going to pay attention. 
Uh, Representative Garoppolo. No, blame Stevenson. He was distracted. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Hollins. I wanted to give a real world example because um, my, whatever, uh, why can't I think of the word? You know, thing that heats my house. Furnace. Burn. Furnace, that's the word. <laughs> my furnace just went out. Uh, actually, wood boiler. <laughs> my furnace just went out recently and it is a gas furnace. And I was interested in upgrading to something that was electrical. I and what, I have the money to replace the furnace, right? But when they were like, yep, it's gonna be another $10,000 on top of that just to upgrade the electrical panel and dig the line out. It was like, okay, well now we're talking about like a $25,000 investment as opposed to a $15,000 investment. And so obviously, as I said, I don't qualify for this program, but somebody could have the money set aside to make a larger in, a larger size investment and adding another $10,000 on top of it is just not possible. So, I mean, I do think there is room there where this would be beneficial to individuals. Thank you, Representative Collins. Representative um, Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, um, <clears throat> you know, it's just, um, I'm just interested. This is uh, just interesting. Um, so the bills that we're hearing today, we can replace roofs. I think we can replace carpets. We can replace siding. We can insulate the house. Now we can redo the electrical work, all on ratepayers and taxpayers' dime. Affordable energy is not affordable when you have to do all this to make the dream work, folks. Um, you know, and the idea that we wouldn't consider, and I have an amendment here, I'd like to offer the A1 amendment as part of this conversation. Okay. Is this an appropriate time, Madam Chair? I think that's Does it works. Yeah, I, I think mean, that works. if you want to go let's, different. Let's go ahead and do the A1 amendment. Yeah, it sounds good, because I think, you know, the conversation we're about to have, I think kind of just glides in real nice. You know, I'm, whether it's a multifamily housing unit, which, you know, reading this bill, so you could be a, a multifamily, you could take a historic, take a grant for a historic building in downtown Minneapolis, uh, with the idea that you're going to rent it to low-income uh, renters and then qualify to upgrade the electrical using this particular grant. Um, and then at some point in time in the future, either sell that multifamily housing unit or if you're an individual, um, because you want to you know, buy a Tesla and plug it in your house, have the state of Minnesota taxpayers pay to upgrade the electrical system so that you can do such things, or a heat pump, or whatever electrical thing you may want to buy, on the backs of either ratepayers or taxpayers, uh, or both. Um, the A1 amendment simply says that within a certain period of time, if you sell the property, whether it's a multifamily, whether it's a, a single family house, that just 10%, just 10% of the investment that rate pay, the, the, the taxpayers in Minnesota made into your home would come back to the state. You can't argue that we're not adding value to people's homes, regardless if you're poor or rich or whatever. If you're redoing the electrical system so that you can plug in a Tesla into the home, I think it's just a small, not the, whatever. <laughs> Whether it's, a, you know, this investment that we're making that sounds like it could cost up to $10,000 per home. This would mean just return it so that not every single dime gets to get transferred with you when you sell that home that just $1,000 of that electrical grant that you receive would come back to the taxpayers of Minnesota. And you could potentially create, I mean, I would be open to an oral amendment that would keep that $1,000 in the program so that you could then give it to someone else. Just a little bit of a little bit of, a, I call it a clawback, which I think is a very fair word for it, because you know, in the reality, we are doing some, I mean, we're about rebuilding people's homes. There'll probably be a bill to replace the two by fours here before long. And, you know, I think in these moments, we need to just step back and say, hey, what would the taxpayers like us to do? And I say just a little bit of money back, um, and I would ask for a roll call on the A1 amendment. Representative Hollins, would you like to respond? Well, a roll call being requested, there will be a roll call. Representative Hollins. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Akam, and thank you, Representative Swazinski. I think I think what your amendment does, I I see what you're trying to do. I understand what your goal is, and I think I can appreciate what you're trying to do, and I'm willing to continue having conversations with you about this. I'm going to recommend a no vote on this right now because our real goal is improving the housing stock for everybody. So whether it's the current owner or it's an improved housing stock 
um, for the person who's buying it later. I think that it's important that we upgrade these electrical panels in general for the good of all Minnesotans. Just like a lot of the bills that we're bringing here when we talk about, I don't want to get into weatherization or pre-weatherization, but this is something that will benefit anybody who's going to own this house moving forward. And certainly the people who built the houses 100 years ago um, were not thinking like, I'm going to put in crummy insulation or, you know, not a very good electrical panel. They're thinking we're doing the best that we can right now for whoever's going to live in it. And all we're doing is trying to upgrade that and make it equitable and accessible to everybody. So for now, I would like to recommend a no vote on the A1 amendment, but I do see what you're trying to get at, and I'm willing to have that conversation with you. Any further discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, um, and the roll call, um, chair votes no. Representative Kraft. No. Representative Sudzinski. Aye. Representative Altendorf. Aye. Representative Bierman. Bierman, no. Representative Carroll. No, but with the uh, provision that there will be further discussions between the author and the <laughs> roll call reflect that. <laughs> it, it shall be reflected. <laughs> you don't need to. Come on. Representative Davis. Aye. Representative Garofalo. Yes, but no, no, never mind. Just yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks. <laughs> Representative Hemmings and Yeager. No. Representative Collins. No. Representative Hornstein. No. Representative Igo is gone. Uh, Representative Newton. Hey. Representative O'Neill. Aye. Representative Reem. No. Representative Stevenson. No. There being um, six ayes and nine nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Any other um, brief? Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Alton. Oh, and then Representative Groflow. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative, for bringing this forward. I guess I just have, I have a few questions. I know in your original testimony, you had said something about replacing gas stoves and can you explain to us just a little bit more is that something that's coming like as a mandate or is that something that would just be uh, people wanting to do it on their own is that what we're just talking about i just was wanted to clarify that i representative holland thank you chair thank you representative alton dort um i do not know of any mandate to replace gas stoves okay. representative holland. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Uh, I have one more follow-up. So, um, just one thing: when you when you talked about this, was just very interesting to me because you talked about the electric panel in our homes, that it's not going to support the increased energy usage. You know, as we start to convert the st the stoves over to electric, you said, or the cars over to electric, you said. So we're we're you know at a very very small in-home level, we're our our electric panels are not going to be able to support the increased electrical use. And I, I know you said that. And I just think that's a really valid point to make right now because that's going to be at a much bigger scale as we're pushing more and more of our things, you know, our appliances, our cars, everything onto this electric grid. What you just said is that's going to happen in our home is truly going to explode at a, at a very, very big level. And I don't think we're looking at the uh, unintended consequences that's coming down the road. And so with that, um, we, I'm going to toss it back to Representative Garofalo and then Representative O'Neill, and then we're going to need to take a vote because we do have one more bill and we can't go long tonight. So um, Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair and Representative Hollins. Um, so electrification, there's times where it's good, there's times where it's bad. I've been an electric vehicle car owner for nine years. I love my... I love my Tesla that my colleague always looks at me when he talks about it. Um, but Representative Hollins, when it comes to the issue you brought up, in, in a, you brought up a personal example, and I just think it's illustrative. We have a cost-benefit decision-making here at the legislature. And in your situation, if it costs $10,000 to convert from a natural gas furnace to an electric furnace, maybe that's the universe saying that you shouldn't be converting to an electric furnace instead of having other people pay for it. Not you personally, but everybody, right? There, there's a cost-benefit analysis, and these programs 
upgrading electric panels, all these things, they're all done for a stated benefit of an environmental benefit. And if we're spending thousands of dollars on infrastructure costs that we have to incentivize to happen, and we're not getting a corresponding environmental benefit, that is failing the cost benefit analysis. So I didn't mean to personalize it, but you brought up that example, okay, Representative Holland. So I just said in that situation, like converting from gas furnaces to electric heat, to electric heat, that is a more expensive option. It costs more to heat. That's why we use gas, natural gas and propane in a cold weather state like Minnesota. And the environmental benefits we get out of forcing those conversions are, or, or making those conversions, that's why they have to be subsidized because they don't make sense. So I'm voting no on your bill, but don't let my comments mean anything other than you do make sense, you're just wrong on this bill. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Collins, brief comment, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Garofalo. I mean, I also blow a fuse every time we have two laptops running and I turn on a hair dryer. So is that the universe telling me they don't, I shouldn't have dry hair? I mean, I'm, I live in a hundred year old house. It just happens and things have to be upgraded. Great, thanks. And we're going to go to last um, question, Representative O'Neill. This will be fun. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, Representative Hollins and I had a conversation offline about the smart panel. So we haven't talked at all about smart panel. And I did talk to an electrician this morning who I do talk to every single day. <laughs> <laughs> and he had no idea what a smart panel was. So I did my own research, and they do exist. And you actually have a letter in the packet from SPAN, who are the, the only one I could find in Minnesota that does, or anywhere in the United States, that does smart panels. And I looked it up, and a smart panel is $4,350, so $4,350 just for the panel, which I think is like four times as much as a regular panel. I'm trying to remember when I looked at this electrician's invoices, <laughs> something like that. It's very expensive. But... My concern isn't so much the expense. My concern is what it actually does and who has access to it. So yes, the homeowner will have all this wonderful I, um, information from this panel. It'll be telling them, hey, this appliance is using too much electricity or um, you know, this, uh, you're not generating enough from your solar panels or, or whatever. So it's gonna tell you all this stuff. And that's cool, that's nice that the homeowner gets that information. My concern is what if somebody else has access to that smart device, yeah, whether it's intentional or unintentional, that now actually has the ability to start turning your circuits off. So we kind of talked about that offline and I know we don't have a lot of time, but I just want to raise that as a concern because when we start doing smart technology, this is something that I can literally do from my phone and I can turn things on and off and I can get information. So uh, let me just give you a real world example. So um, I saw Excel Energy in here. So I have Excel Energy and I have, I've given them permission to turn off my air conditioner when we have peak load. So they have the ability to shut it off. They have a special sh shut off and it's electronic obviously. Um, so that e technology already exists, but this is like next level. This is like, okay, so I get it for the homeowner. That's interesting, but um, has there been any conversations, Representative Hollins, in your conversations with this, since you did add the smart um, panel t uh, language to the delete all, about SPAN and um, the smart panels and the access of who would have access and what are the potentials and, and that sort of thing? And um, I will just maybe say, since the bill is being laid over, there can continue to be further conversations. And so maybe you can respond to that in any final comments. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam <laughs> Chair. Thank you, Representative O'Neill. So we had some conversations about uh, the smart panels, and I'm happy to continue those conversations with you and with the experts who are doing this. I think our, our goal is just to be as efficient as possible with the electrification on the grid, but let's continue the conversations because your security concerns are real, and I believe, like, I think we can get to a happy place. Great. That's it. With, with that, the <laughs> bill is laid over and the conversations continue. And with that, I'm going to turn the gavel over to Vice Chair Kraft and Google Nest. Okay, while um, Chair Aikum is moving over there, uh, I'm going to I'm going to uh, re I'm going to move that House File 1973 be re-referred to the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, folks, we can just have attention. Um, Chair Aikum, tell us about your bill. Great. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. I'm going to be brief in, in describing the bill. Um, it's um, what it's doing is um, building on um, the existing greenhouse gas emissions that we currently have. In um, 2007, in Minnesota, we passed the Next Generation Energy Act, which set out um, the um, greenhouse gas emission reduction goals that were um, based in the science of that time. And here we are, fast forward to today. Um, we have come quite a long way. And um, so it's time to update our goals. And so um, this bill, it updates the goals to be in line with current science as well as in, in, li in, alignment, in alignment with um, the Governor Wall's um, uh, climate framework. Um, and it also um, <clears throat> looks to um, make sure that any actions that we're doing at a, at, at a state level will be um, mindful of uh, disadvantaged communities at, whenever possible and make sure that we're getting um, regular reporting on the progress that we are making. And um, with that, there are a few testifiers who are here to um, present on the bill today. Right. Uh, I have Frank Kolosh, and then next on up is Kate Knuth. I would ask if the next person can come up there, and please two minutes max, less if possible. Oh, thank you, Mr. Kolosh. Mr. Kolosh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Frank Kolosh. I am the Assistant Commissioner for Air and Climate Policy with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and I use he, him pronouns. And I appreciate the author's bill and work in climate change and addressing climate action in Minnesota. While this bill isn't part of the governor's proposal, we clearly acknowledge that the bill reflects the emission reduction goals included in Minnesota's climate action framework released in September of 2022. This addresses one pillar of the framework on the emission reductions target, but it also addresses a, a second pillar on being equitable in climate action in Minnesota. These updated goals represent the most current science in order to minimize the most devastating impacts of climate change. These goals will bring Minnesota in line with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the federal government's nationally determined contributions to address climate change on a global level. The Governor's Advisory Council on Climate Change also emphatically uh, endorsed the and identified the importance of including these goals in Minnesota's climate action framework. And before I conclude, I want to note that for the fiscal note, we have uh, had conversations with the author and we will be amending the fiscal notes to reflect that there's no uh, fiscal impact to the agency based on what we understand now what the duties caused by the bill for the Push Control Agency on an annual basis would be. And with that, we look forward to working with the author uh, as this bill moves forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kalash. Ms. Knuth, and next is Heidi Roop. So, Ms. Knuth, welcome back to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Dr. Kate Knuth, Managing and Research Director for the 100% Campaign, and I'm here to support House File 1973. The 100% Campaign supports House File 1973 because we're committed to helping Minnesotans build a more equitable, clean energy and climate future. And to do so, we need to reduce emissions rapidly. It's in the global warming of 1.5 degrees special report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change found people need to reduce emissions 45% by 2030 from a 2010 baseline and net zero by 2050. These are the goals that align with the House File 1973 goals. To put it simply, to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, Minnesota needs to do what House File 1973 sets out as goals for our state. We do know that setting goals alone does not guarantee pollution reductions. We, the pollution reductions we are seeking will happen, but goals matter. They set the basis for analysis of what Minnesota needs to do and plans to do and align the work of state agencies, local governments, and private sector partners. Minnesotans to have, deserve to have all of this work striving to do what is actually necessary to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. We support ongoing review of emissions reduction goals, taking into account the science of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We support this, considering this body's work because the IPCC facilitates a coordinated process bringing together the best climate science and scientists across national governments. There's no better scientific body to look to than them. 
We're glad to see House File 1973 taking on the challenge of addressing disproportionate impacts of climate change, both in addressing it and from the impacts of climate change itself. This part of the bill will help bring about the more equitable climate future we seek at the 100% campaign. On a personal note, I'm glad to support House File 1973 today. Back in 2007, when Minnesota set its original targets, I was a first-term legislator, and advocating and voting for these goals was a highlight of my legislative service. The goals have made us make real progress on addressing climate change in Minnesota. And here we are 16 years later and quite a bit has changed. What science shows we need to do to address climate change has changed, mostly because people have not reduced emissions fast enough since 2007. We therefore need to ramp up our effort, efforts even more and House File 1973 will help us do that. Well, I'm nervous about climate change impacts ramping up. I've never been more hopeful. I'm hopeful now because I believe in Minnesotans and our ability to do great things together. We are ready to take on climate change in 1973. We'll align our state's actions with the scale and pace of what's needed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roop. And then uh, on deck is Ellen Anderson. Welcome back to the committee. Please uh, introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Dr. Roop, Chair Acom, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to join you. I'm an assistant professor of climate science and an extension specialist at the University of Minnesota. And I'm here today to specifically address the scientific basis for 1973. The other testifiers have, have mentioned this. I'm going to sort of lean into where these numbers are derived from. Uh, the Paris Climate Agreement committed to the goal of limiting the increase of global temperature to be well below 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit and to, quote, pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, above pre-industrial levels. If current rates of warming continue, global average temperature is likely to reach the 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2.7 degree target uh, between 2030 and 2052. Um, that's within the lifetime of most people alive today, and hopefully all of us in this room will be alive to experience a not-so-warm world. Um, but with every amount of additional warming, the costs and challenges of climate impacts increase. Um, a half a degree Celsius warming means billions more exposed to heat waves around the globe, a doubling of losses to U.S. GDP, increased crop losses, worsening water scarcity, and negative effects on human health. Unfortunately, when current global commitments are accounted for, we're, we're on a path to fall well short of these goals. Um, the client's science clearly outlines that what we choose to do or not over the next 10 to 20 years will determine what our climate, the climate future holds for us, all of us in this room. House File 1973 aligns the state's goals with the most recent science produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and importantly addresses the disproportionate impacts and burdens of climate change and climate solutions on different communities and populations. The IPCC outlines and provides many alternative global greenhouse gas emission reductions pathways that get us to these goals. All of these pathways share certain features, including steep near-term emissions and energy demand reductions, net zero by 2050, decarbonization of electricity and other fuels, deep reductions in agricultural emissions, and some form of carbon dioxide removal through carbon storage on land or sequestration in geologic reservoirs. The amended goals in 1973 are supported by the most recent report by the IPCC on mitigation of climate change published in 2022. The report states very clearly, quote, all global modeled pathways that limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and those that limit warming to 2 degrees Celsius involve rapid and deep and in most cases immediate greenhouse gas emissions reductions in all sectors. And it's not just robust science that supports these targets. The emission goals, as have already been stated, are aligned with Minnesota's climate action framework to which over 3,000 Minnesotans contributed. So the state's most recent report on emissions shows we're making progress. We need to do more, and it makes sense to align with the best available science. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roop. Next, Ellen Anderson. <laughs> Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your quick testimony, I hope. <laughs> It'll be quick. Thank you so much. I've cut half of it out. Um, I'm Ellen Anderson. I'm a climate program director at Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. And we are very proud that we did work with Representative Acom to create this bill, which we like to call the Next Generation Climate Act. And um, as, as Representative Acom said, that that passed in 2007. And at the time, we followed the science in 2007, which said that we should 
reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050, but now we need a new law because the leading scientists of the world have updated the science and made it clear we face nothing less than a code red for humanity if we don't act. They say we must cut emissions in half in this decade and we must achieve net zero emissions by 2050, and that's exactly what Representative Acom's bill does. In 2007, we came together to do this, but we do know that we didn't meet those targets. And I would like to say just briefly, um, what's different? What's different? How do we think that we're going to be able to meet these, these new targets? Um, so what's really different in 2023 compared to 2007 is that we are all now experiencing the impacts of climate change. Think about winter rain, later summers, extreme doubts, and many more things that we've all seen and experienced. Minnesotans are, con are more concerned about global warming than ever, and they want action taken by their leaders. And what else is different? We now have the technology and we have the expertise to cut carbon while improving our quality of life. And finally, what else is different? I believe this is the year of climate action for Minnesota, which will put us on track to what science tells us, to protect our future of ourselves and our next generations and future generations. And House File 1973 is a giant step towards that future. So thank you and please vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move to member questions and comments. And I've got first Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Aiken, Aiken, um can you buy Rex in order to meet this goal? Chair Aikum. Well, so as a, this is the, that's not, no. Um, the state would be, at least as I understand how the state handles their um, greenhouse gas inventory at this point, it is not involved um, buying RECs. Representative Swinsky. So, Madam and Chair. Will not, and will not going forward. Yeah. Okay, so Madam Chair, would this, would this bill is as a goal or will this outlaw coal burning in other states? Madam Chair. So this is a goal, just like the Next Generation Energy Act is a goal. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have um, penalties, um, but I'd like that to, I mean, I, I think we're, we know where we need to go and this bill just puts into law that that is the direction we need to go. Representative Madam Chair, if, if you were able to kind of wave a magic wand, uh, would you like to put penalties in this bill? <laughs> Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> if I were king, um, what I want us to do is move toward reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And so I think I have said many times I much prefer carrots than sticks. And so I think that we have opportunities to incentivize the behavior that we want to see. Okay. Madam Chair, last, just to finish, you know, um, you, you mentioned carrots and sticks. I just want to remind the body here that 3 billion people globally burn feces and sticks to heat and cook their food. So regardless of what we do, when we look at coal, when we look at other means of, of electrification throughout the, the world, that three billion people burn feces and sticks to cook and heat their homes. So that's right. goal. I'm gonna to move to Representative Altendorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Uh, just real quick, um, can you can you please answer, Representative Acom? Uh, everyone that testified, are they somehow receiving tax dollars, or they're being supported through the tax dollar program? Every one of the testifiers, Madam Chair. So I guess I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, do you mean are they public employees? Correct, or they're receiving like they're a nonprofit and they're receiving taxpayer funding. Um, I am not sure that I have the financials for those nonprofits. I don't think um, from MCEA or um, Dr. Knuth, I think that um, we have a university professor and a state employee. Thank you, Madam, <coughs> Madam Chair. And just let me finish yep, real quick. So um, my point is, you know, we continue to pass legislation that's benefiting people. They come in and testify that they need more dollars um, for the science that they're promoting. And specifically, I just want to comment on the last testifier that she very much said over and over, what's different, what's different. 
I have that question, too, because in the 80s, I was told California was going under. I was told as a child that um, we that we were at a destruction if we didn't do something. And now, 40 years later, we're having the same conversation. Thank you. Okay, final question for Representative Igo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Greatly appreciate it. So my quick question for you, Madam Chair, is um, will this only be emissions that happen inside the state that are going to be counted? Madam Chair. Um, as I understand the emissions inventory taken by the um, department, yes, it's only within. Oh, it looks like maybe he has a clarification if he can run down here really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colesh. Sorry coming in last year. Mr. No, 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 you're good. Please state your name real quickly for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, my name is Frank Kolesh, Assistant Commissioner for Air and Climate Policy with the Pollution Control Agency. To your question, in the most part, it is only in-state emissions. However, the Next Generation Energy Act does require us to calculate emissions for imported electricity, and we have a method to do that, and we do that currently with our greenhouse gas emission inventory. Okay. So, can I just, quick, if it's 30 seconds, Representative thank, Igo. Thank you. Um, was just going to follow up. I think that maybe a way to make this bill better would be to talk about all the things that are coming in for mission wise, right? Because we were talking about this in House File 7. You know, if we're gonna get solar panels and other components from around the world where carbon emissions are high, we should be considering that in our carbon emissions in the state if it's making our state better. Because it's a global environment, it's a global climate, we talk about that a lot. So just a, a, a suggestion I have for the bill. Thank you. Okay, so with that, um, Representative Bacon uh, renews her motion that House File 1973 be re-referred to the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. No. Aye. The motion prevails and the bill is re-referred. And with that, we are adjourned.